Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. We're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. I think it was the right thing to do, and I think it will help us move forward unimpeded and really be able to get the job done for the families, for the community of Surfside. Champlain Tower South demolished overnight. Search and rescue teams back in the rubble today. But will tropical storm Elsa force them to stop searching again? She has already battered the Caribbean islands and is heading towards Florida now. A look at Elsa's latest path and the tropical storm warning in effect for Florida's west coast. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Every, everyone is traveling, everyone wants to get out. We've been cooped up for way too long. Plus planes, trains and automobiles, millions of Americans traveling over the 4th of July weekend. A look at the record setting crowds, traffic and delays. We start today with a search for victims in Surfside, Florida. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hilliard is there. Vaughn, we now know 27 people have died, three more bodies pulled from the rubble. Authorities say last night's demo only left dust on the collapsed condo pile. So how is that demolition helping search crews move faster uh, and try to find more victims there? Uh, Alice, we're going to talk about it, that impending storm. And I, if I want to answer your question here, because that's obviously the most el important element of what we have seen over the course of the day. But we also have to acknowledge real fast that literally in like the last five, ten minutes, the rain has really started oh, to no, come look down at this. here in the Surfside it's area. It's terrible, Vaughn. But I, I think it's, but it's important to know because the rescue crews did have a great chunk of time. Because that demolition went well, the rescue crews were able to get back onto that rubble at about 1 a.m. this morning and essentially have about the last 15 hours to work through at an accelerated rate through that rubble zone. I want to let you hear directly from Mayor Cava of Miami-Dade County about some of the advantages they had to work with here today and hopefully in the days ahead. Truly, we could not continue without bringing this building down. The area closest to the building was the area that we had not been able to access, and that is where we, we needed to go. As we speak, the teams are working on that part of the pile that was not accessible before the building was demolished. The decision to knock down that existing uh, structure was made because of the danger that it posed. There was the potential that it could collapse, not only on that rubble site, but also those rescue crews that were, were working so diligently to find those 118 that are still uh, unaccounted for at this time. Vaughn, it's just wild. And I'm sorry I didn't ask you about it at the start. Now that we've gotten a closer look at you, I can see just the water pouring off there. I mean, my goodness. They absolutely can't get a break there, and, and neither uh, can you in, in your coverage. I have to ask this question because it's just something incredible that we have seen throughout the last yeah. week or so. A Surfside's mayor making it clear that this is a rescue mission, and it will be until everyone is accounted for, saying that we'll see miracles uh, in the days ahead. I I've just been blown away by the hopefulness there and the resilience and the commitment of the folks there. What are they telling you about both their hopes and the challenges ahead uh, besides the weather they're contending with? This is now day 12 uh, since that tragedy. And the reality is, is that only two survivors have actually been pulled out of the rubble. And those two individuals, it was in the immediate aftermath in which those buildings went down. Local officials are not the ones who want to extinguish the fire of hope. And I just want to let you hear from one of them, who's the commissioner of the Miami-Dade uh, uh, Commission. And I, I want to let you hear for yourself, because this is the sort of attitude that these officials, neighbors, community members are trying to hold on to for those family members. We're praying, we're working, and we're getting through this together. We're still playing, praying that, to possibly find survivors. We're, we're praying for peace and answers for the family, and we're praying that we can find the, the information. We can figure out exactly why this happened. Again, though, today, three more individuals were recovered deceased. That puts that total up to 27 deceased now at this site and 118 still unaccounted for. Uh, so, Vaughn, as I, as I look at you standing there in the pouring rain, I mean, what can they work through there? You know, it, it, this certainly is not making things easier, but how much longer can crews work through? What is it that would, would actually, you know, prevent them from being able to get back in the rubble and have them say, we got to get you out of here. It's a safety concern. Uh, can they work through what you're dealing with right now? 
we're told that the rain is not going to be what inhibits this rescue effort, that they're able to continue that process okay. in the rain. The concern is ultimately high winds uh, and also a, a lightning. Lightning uh, earlier last week had actually stopped the halt for periods of time when thunderstorms had rolled in, which halted the crews from able, being able to do their work. I want to let you hear, though, uh, directly again from Mayor Kava here just this afternoon, who sort of set up the way in mm -hmm. which they are looking at this storm that, again, literally in these last 15 minutes, just hit Surfside. Take a listen. At this time, we are, are very confident that the storm will not have major impacts on the area. There will be wind, there will be rain. Uh, we'll be able to work all the way up to 30 mile per hour uh, wind speed uh, and lightning strikes. That's all that will keep us off the pile. So far, Allison, we have not been given information to suggest that this rescue team, this rescue mission here has stopped. I don't believe the winds are at 30 miles per hour. Again, this is more torrential rainfall. We haven't seen lightning here in the sky yet, yeah. but this only complicates this. We're glad, we're thankful that that demolition process last night went so well and effectively, but then this was the second hurdle. And we expect uh, over the course of these next hours, this next day, that this sort of weather could plague uh, the greater Surfside area and these rescue efforts here. Yeah. Well, Vaughn, uh, through your reporting and your colleagues reporting, we have heard so much about potential miracles on the way. Uh, the crews there have such hope and such faith. It's kind of hard to believe we might not see some sort of a miracle when they are so committed and dedicated. Thanks so much for your reporting today. Uh, we'll, we'll keep holding out hope. Thanks, Vaughn. The Florida coast gearing up for Tropical Storm Elsa, that deadly storm heading that way after it battered the Caribbean and barreled through Cuba. NBC News correspondent Sam Brocks in the Florida Keys. Allison, good to be with you. I'm in Higgs Beach right now here in Key West, where we are under a tropical storm warning. That is expected to take effect for a number of hours as conditions start to weaken. But still, as you can see over my shoulder, there's people out there on the pier. They were swimming just a little while ago. It was sunshine, in fact. But conditions right now are changing. There was an emergency declaration, or I should say a state of emergency declared, for 15 counties in the state of Florida, stretching all the way from Miami-Dade down here to Monroe County and certainly all over the Gulf, those portions, especially near Tampa, that are expecting heavy rainfall. What we're seeing here in terms of officials' reaction is they are not mandating any evacuations, but are advising people who either live on the water or have an RV to get out of there and find a safe structure because there should be somewhere in the neighborhood of two to four, maybe even six inches of rain in spots here and a surf, a surge, I should say, of one to two feet. So that's all going on right now. I was at the airport recently because officials are also worried about all the travelers, the tens of thousands. Thousands of them that come to Key West to vacation for the July 4th holiday, but they got to get out. And the deep concern right now is either putting them on the roadways on a single lane highway where it can take hours to get in and out as the rain and winds are coming in or more difficultly trying to fly out. We know at Key West Airport, they've already had several flights canceled this evening. There's about 78 staggered throughout the course of the day. But once the wind gusts hit 35 miles an hour higher, the airlines then have to consider canceling those flights. In fact, we spoke with a couple people who either had their flight canceled and now don't know how they're going to get out or anticipating it. Here's what they told us. Are you worried about getting stuck here with a storm coming? Yes, I am. I've never been in a tropical storm or a hurricane. It is so unpredictable. They can't tell us when, where, which airline. Just wait it out. So that, that makes you that's all we're going to do. And as local officials here buckle down, we have already seen what Tropical Storm Elsa can do as Hurricane Elsa, because when it ripped through parts of the Caribbean, Barbados saw more than 1,000 homes damaged. Two people died in the Dominican Republic, a 15-year-old boy and a 75-year-old woman. When the walls collapsed on them, someone else also died in St. Lucia. And we know that in Cuba, 180,000 people were evacuated for fear of severe mudslides or flooding. And that's all going on right now. Cuba getting hit hard as it is then expected to make its way toward where we are in the Florida Keys. All eyes right now on Elsa. That's the very latest from Key West. NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman joining me now. So, all right, Michelle, everyone wants to know where Elsa is going, where her path is. What's the latest? Yeah. Hi there, Allison. And yes, yeah, so it's now over Cuba. It made landfall as of 2 o'clock over Cuba. But 
I think Ron and Sam told really a great story of how this storm can be, right? So it's not just the center of the low we're looking at. We're looking at those outer rain bands already touching Surfside, Florida. We're seeing some rain also in the Keys, not exactly where Sam was, but certainly in Marathon, Florida. And that's just going to be the story over the next several hours. So let's look at those tropical alerts, Key West, under that tropical storm warning, as Sam had mentioned. We're seeing those alerts all the way along the west coast of Florida. And that's where we expect the biggest impact with Elsa over the next several days. So as we look at the current stats, this was at, uh, as of the latest advisory. We're looking at 60 mile per hour winds, which is still really a strong tropical storm. I mean, Elsa has been overperforming since it began. It became a hurricane on Friday. That is two months before when we typically see a hurricane, and it really has maintained its strength. This will be the test, though, as it goes over that rough terrain of Cuba over the next next six, seven, eight hours, and then emerges back into the Gulf. So we do expect some weakening and then re-strengthening in that Gulf of Mexico. It's so warm. It's like bath water is giving that energy to the storm. So look by Tuesday, mm-hmm. early Tuesday, we're going to be uh, west of Key West, and then it's going to be in the Gulf for quite a while. So it could really strengthen. Strength, and that's what we're going to watch closely. But the National Hurricane Center keeping this a tropical storm. And you know, you know what? They've done a really good job. They've been very consistent with this track. And so then we're seeing landfall Wednesday morning, right around 8 o'clock, uh, in the Big Bend region of Florida, and then the Carolinas by Thursday into the Mid-Atlantic by Friday. So we have a lot of days to get ahead. Now, rainfall amounts, again, uh, Vaughn was talking, and I have been listening to officials for, you know, the past three, four days. Rainfall, not so much a problem in Surfside. It will be the lightning, and certainly they're going to see right. some lightning. They're actually under a severe thunderstorm warning, and that will be the case over the next several days. I mean, I looked back at the climate data since June 24th when the collapse happened, and every day besides two days, they've had thunderstorms. That is just the nature of summer in South Florida. And this tropical air mass is going to add to that. So lightning could halt it for sure. And then we're looking at those winds. Now we're looking at the potential for 26 mile per hour winds in Surfside. Again, that's a good, that's good news. We're not, we're hoping not to get the 30, but when you have rain bands, you could see some strong winds in those rain bands. It's not going to be hours and hours of that, but you could certainly see a gust or two. So they're going to have to pay close attention to that. It's really to the west of Allison where you see Key West, 54 miles per hour, Naples, 33, 43 in Tampa. And then where we see that landfall right around the Big Bend region, uh, we're looking at pretty gusty winds. So that will be uh, where the biggest impact will be. Storm surge, another one. I know Sam mentioned that, too, where they're experiencing that in Key West. And what storm surge is, it's that push of wind. So you expect it where you strong the where you see the strongest winds. It's that push of wind just piling up that water. And the west coast of Florida, Florida is really low lying. So you see that piling up pretty quickly anywhere from Cedar Key, St. Petersburg, down to Naples. Again, the future cast today. We're looking at those flooding rains, potentially uh, landslides, deadly landslides, mudslides, localized flooding. The impacts are already reaching the Keys in some spots, but really picking up overnight. And then into Tuesday, strong winds for the Keys. That's going to be a tough day for them there. So if you have not prepared and you live in the Keys, you want to do that now because things are really going to start to deteriorate and that rain, rain and wind for Florida. So Allison, really, you know, we're watching the center of the low, but we do have to still think about Surfside. And I know they're experts. They're watching it very, very close. And that's why they made that decision last night uh, for the implosion. But still, they could see some uh, even an isolated chance for a tornado, too. Yeah. Oh, Michelle, I keep saying it, but they just can't get a break there. Even if the rain doesn't stop them, it certainly slows down the process. Uh, I know. Let's hope this one passes through as quickly as possible and and with as little incident. Michelle, thanks so much and hope you had a good holiday weekend. I did. Hope you did, too. Thank you. National parks and the businesses around them breaking records this holiday weekend as Americans take advantage of a little sightseeing post-pandemic. But some of those businesses are struggling to keep up with all the demand. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry is in the Black Hills of South Dakota at Mount Rushmore. Allison, we're still seeing big crowds here on July the 5th. Obviously, this is one of the places that Americans are driving long distances to visit. The business has really been booming over the weekend. Year over year, 150% increase in Keystone, which is the nearby town, which is great. Businesses, however, are struggling a little bit with labor shortages, having to be very creative about how they find workers, how they retain workers, how they attract workers. Overhanging all of this, of course, is this Delta variant. It has a lot of people concerned. It's raised the question again about vaccines. I have to tell you, in covering this the past six months to 12 months, it feels like nobody is undecided anymore, that people have either gotten the vaccine or they're not gonna get it. 
I told them that I'll take my vaccine on the way to the cemetery in about 15 or 20 years. I don't believe it's safe. You want to give it more time and think about it? Or I have you... an immune system, so I'm going to be okay. So she got it. I had COVID. I recovered. We lived together. The only thing I didn't do. I figured do that's the best immunity you can was get. Kiss her on the mouth the whole time, and I didn't get it. For so many folks, this was sort of the first chance they've had since lockdown to get out. We've heard from a number of people saying we wanted to come to South Dakota because it is open, because there is no mask mandate, because of the great outdoor spaces. The hope, obviously, that everybody has is that the Delta variant won't prevent that from happening in the future. Allison. Gas is more expensive. Rental cars are, too. But that didn't keep people home this Fourth of July. And forget about stretching out and getting a little leg room on flights. Those are pretty packed, too. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has more from California. Allison, it's been a busy day here at Los Angeles International Airport. At one point, we had lines uh, from the terminal next to us extend all the way to this terminal from people lining up for the check-in. And that has been the case in other airports. Uh, the expectation is that today would be the peak of the holiday travel. Uh, meanwhile, airlines and hotels have realized it is time for them to catch up. An Independence Day weekend to liberate Americans stuck at home during the pandemic. I think everyone wants to travel right now. New records set. As experts say, we reached the peak for travel today. It's psycho now. It took us like 40 minutes to get through security to get here. Yeah. The TSA screening almost 2.2 million people on Friday, the highest number since the start of the pandemic. That same day, Gas Buddy reporting the greatest single day demand for gas since 2019. All despite high gas prices averaging $3.12, almost a dollar more than a year ago. It was a lot more than I was expected to pay. But gas wasn't the only expensive part of the weekend. You're seeing rental car shortages. It's hard to get a dinner reservation. Hotels are going for exorbitant prices. They're adding COVID fees right and left. Travelers wondering, how did things get so expensive? Demand has come back incredibly quickly, um, and we've seen prices driven primarily by renewed travel demand. California, Florida, and Hawaii accounting for a quarter of all car rentals and flights. Some airlines overwhelmed. American Airlines, Southwest, Delta, they can't keep up with demand. They don't have the staffing for it. Many of them offering incentives like double pay and $100 bonuses to staff working through the weeks to come. Where everyone is traveling, everyone wants to get out. We've been cooped up for way too long. A new start for travelers, hoping it's the end of the pandemic. Now, with so many looking to get out and travel this summer, the experts are recommending people to plan ahead, book now, but try to do it for the end of the summer. And hopefully by then, the companies and the airlines have caught up and things will be a little more organized for a better experience as the nation uh, gets prepared and just gets used to people traveling all over again. All right, let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez. So happy to have her hanging out with us today doing the headlines. Issa, thank you so much. Hey, Allison, happy to be here. We have a lot of headlines to get to today, and we will start in England, where Prime Minister Boris Johnson plans to scrap laws requiring face masks and social distancing later this month. Johnson says legal controls will be replaced by personal responsibility. Meantime, Kate Middleton is self-isolating after someone she came in contact with tested positive for COVID-19. A Kensington Palace spokesperson says the Duchess of Cambridge is not experiencing any symptoms, but is following all relevant government guidelines. And in Japan, a giant landslide ripped through a seaside resort town, killing at least three people and leaving at least 80 missing. The Japanese prime minister says rescue workers and Coast Guard personnel are working to rescue those who may be buried under the mud. And on the outskirts of Bangkok today, thousands of people forced to evacuate their homes after a factory explosion. The blast killed at least one rescue worker and wounded 29 others. Officials say 70 houses were damaged and fires were still being fought hours after the explosion. The cause has not been determined. 
and are evil. The Russian group behind the biggest global ransomware attack we've seen is now demanding $70 million in Bitcoin. The hackers took down software management company Casilla and locked an alleged 1 million devices over the weekend. President Biden says he's directed full resources toward investigating the attack. And in Ocean City, Maryland, Fourth of July fireworks shows were canceled after some of the pyrotechnics accidentally went off Sunday morning. Workers were setting up one of the city's two fireworks shows when the explosives were unintentionally set off. Employees with the fireworks company only had minor injuries. Those videos were just unbelievable to watch. Allison? Oh, wild there. Issa, thank you so much. We are closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. That's not to say the battle against COVID-19 is over. We've got a lot more work to do. President Biden celebrating progress against the pandemic, even though the White House missed its July 4th goal of getting one COVID shot in 70 percent of American adult arms. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli is on the North Lawn. Mike, our White House team reporting uh, it'll take another month to meet Biden's goal. And the White House is already looking ahead, assessing the next challenge the pandemic will bring and recalibrating expectations. So what are those next challenges and how is the administration getting ready for them? Well, Allison, I was actually on the South Lawn last night, got to enjoy those terrific fireworks as the president also watched on from the Truman balcony. And in his remarks, the enthusiasm that I think the White House was hoping to head into this holiday with uh, around the fact that so many of us were able to celebrate in a much different way than the year before was tempered by the fact that the Delta variant is such a rising concern both to this administration and to health officials across the country. And that's one of the big challenges ahead is to make sure that they close the gap of those who remain unvaccinated either by choice or by lack of access. We see the White House deploying surge teams across the country, especially into these areas where they are seeing serious spikes, especially with Delta variant cases. The other concern is the fact that the reason that the White House is missing this 70 percent goal of adults getting at least a single dose is primarily the youngest cohort of that group, 18 to 26 year olds. Now, some in the White House believe that this will sort of solve itself as these especially 18 to 24 year olds get ready to head back to college and to university in the fall. A lot of schools are considering requiring the vaccination, so there might be a spike there. Uh, but they want to make sure that they do hit that 70 percent goal uh, ultimately with the whole adult population. It's just going to take a few extra weeks, Allison. All right, Mike, you have to forgive me if in my first question I was a little bit distracted because you know what I'm about to ask you about. Tell me about this Kelly O sticker that you're wearing because I'm just loving what's happening here right now. Oh, I, I didn't I didn't know you'd notice, Allison, but I'm glad you did. Our, our dear colleague, <laughs> beloved colleague. Uh, Kelly O'Donnell is running for president. She's running for president of the White House Correspondents Association. Uh, she is as qualified as anybody could be for that job. And yes. the polls close this afternoon. Oh, heck so yes. consider this my final bit of get out the vote effort on behalf of the Kelly O campaign. Oh, that is the coolest thing I've heard or seen. Please report back when we have the results. If I was able to vote, she would certainly have mine. Uh, I could not agree more uh, with everything you said about our beloved Kelly O. So that is very cool. Uh, I spotted that one right away. I had a feeling, or <laughs> I think you had a feeling that I would. Uh, I, I have to ask you a question about some changes around the White House, Mike. I, I understand the Secret Service took down fencing uh, and barricades yesterday so that visitors can walk up to the North Lawn fence and see your fantastic reporting up close uh, once again. <laughs> Those barriers, as we know, went up last summer after the George Floyd protests. Why did they come down this weekend in particular? Yeah, it really is remarkable, Allison, to, to be able to look over and see people standing just uh, behind the, the gates there. And really what we saw over the part, uh, better part of the last year was a real fortification of this area north of the White House, especially around Lafayette Park. We remember the scene just a little over a year ago when President Trump walked across uh, through a lot of those protests around Black Lives Matter uh, to St. John's Episcopal Church. What we've seen, especially over the last few months, is a gradual drawdown of those barriers. First, they reopened the park, then they reopened most uh, of the uh, street, but not the street where you could actually walk just outside the gate. Uh, and then we noticed on the 4th of July of all days that they had dropped even that remaining Barrier. Now, the Secret Service is not commenting, as you would expect, uh, about their, their protective uh, protocols. They only said that they're doing everything they can to continue to make sure both uh, the public has access to public spaces, uh, but also that they're ensuring the safety of its protectees, in this case, the President of the United States. 
It's unclear if it was a coincidence that it was Fourth of July weekend, but it was all the more uh, conspicuous given that this is the weekend uh, where you have some of the highest uh, tourist foot traffic, especially last night as people were in the area going yeah. down to the mall to see the fireworks. Well, Mike, thanks so much for reporting on this and for your campaigning uh, for Kelly O. Please keep us posted there. You got it. Thanks, Allison. The Taliban warning all foreign troops must be out of Afghanistan by September 11th or they'll be at risk. The group stepping up its threats as the U.S. ends its 20 year war. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has more on the Taliban takeover. Even before U.S. troops finish their withdrawal from Afghanistan, America's old enemies are making a comeback. The Taliban, the group that sheltered Osama bin Laden, allowing him to plan 9-11, is on a major offensive, capturing around 150 Afghan military outposts in the last two months, including nearly a dozen this weekend. In most cases, Afghan security forces, trained and funded by the United States, surrendered without firing a shot, allowing the Taliban to seize weapons. But one group holding the line is the Afghan commandos, the elite troops trained by American special ops are now carrying out around 100 operations a day. About 90 percent of the combat Every missions, the according to their commanding general. If we are committed, we will fight them and we will push them back. But the Taliban's biggest gain so far appears to be psychological. The world watched this week as the U.S. left Bagram Air Base quietly, leaving in stealth for their security. The American withdrawal is a huge morale boost for the Taliban and all Islamic extremists, presenting the U.S. pullout as a God-given victory. Several Afghan officials tell NBC News al-Qaeda, ISIS and other radicals are returning to Afghanistan to witness and take part in what they're calling the final victory, the Taliban pushing out the world's greatest superpower. Once again, Afghanistan is becoming a magnet for al-Qaeda. They're coming here. They are coming and Afghanistan will be a graveyard for them as well. The terrorist threat is already rising. This week, Afghan airport security located a musical instrument packed with explosives designed to blow up a flight to Kabul. Al-Qaeda and other foreign extremists are coming to Afghanistan through Pakistan, the same route Al-Qaeda used before 9-11. Canada kicking off the first phase of its border reopening today. It's been shut down for nearly 16 months. Fully vaccinated Canadian citizens, permanent residents and other essential travelers can enter the country without a 14 day quarantine. But no tourists just yet. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster is at the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit. It links the U.S. to Canada. Looking good out there, Shaq. Uh, So tell us more about the restrictions Canada's lifting as part of this soft reopening. Hi there, Allison. Well, these are restrictions that have been in place for the past 16 months since the start of the pandemic. But Canada is saying that as of 1159 p.m. Uh, this evening, uh, any fully vaccinated Canadian who travels to the United States can go back home without having that mandatory two weeks in quarantine. And this was a quarantine that was strictly enforced. So that's a new restriction being lifted that can allow for the flow of more people across the other side of the border back to the United States. But it's also highlighting that all the other restrictions, including restrictions on Americans, are still in place. So it's the first step in this phase reopening that we're hearing from Canada. Yeah. So, Shaq, we still don't know when the government will fully reopen the border. How is this affecting businesses there? I mean, I know this is progress, but they must be a little bit frustrated at this stage of the game. Yeah. And, you know, it all goes back to that economic impact. There's an estimate that one point five billion dollars are lost every month the border has been closed travel has been reduced to about 90 per- or has been reduced by 90 percent uh, since the start of this pandemic so for business owners including one that we spoke to they're looking forward to a reopening but they're calling for a more aggressive reopening listen to a little bit of our conversation the port here on area typically relies on 50 percent of the business is from the canadians so half at least half. It's not even restaurant industry. It's uh, the boutique down the road. It's the, uh, you know, the person who makes candles, the person who makes wellness products. They're being affected by it majorly. 
And Allison, you know, one thing that we forget is in these border areas, people go across the border to do basic things. Think about how you may travel to get your hair done or you may travel right. to a specific restaurant. Well, some people right. travel across the bridge to do that and they can't do that and haven't been able to do sure. that for the past 16 months. Yeah, for those of us who live far from the border, it seems like such a, an exotic thing to do. But you got folks doing it as part of their daily routine, <laughs> yeah. and they can't right now. Uh, I know you spoke with Michigan Congressman right. Bill Hazenga. What did he tell you about the lockdown? Yeah, he's putting a lot of pressure on the Biden administration. And it's important to note that that pressure is also being received uh, from some Democrats as well. But he's asking the Biden administration to increase their pressure on the Canadian government. Listen to a little bit of why he's doing that. Things are not where they need to be uh, or where many on both sides of the border believe it should be uh, in regards to the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, it's in complete lockdown. Uh, it is uh, very, very restrictive uh, for personal travel. Uh, but that personal travel sounds like, oh, I just wanted to go across and, and have a vacation. That's not necessarily it. Uh, there's families that are separated. Uh, there's uh, people who are separated from their businesses and their property. And and uh, that's a, that's a problem. You're hearing those similar points being made from Democrats as well. Even uh, my majority leader, Chuck Schumer, uh, who represents the state of New York, also bringing that up. One thing to note, while the Biden administration has been relatively quiet about these restrictions, uh, we did hear from Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau this weekend, who called this a significant step forward and said that he's going to be analyzing the, re the reaction to this and the data from this uh, first step to see how quickly the rest of the reopening will take place, Allison. You know, Shaq, the congressman brings up a great point. This isn't just people itching to go on vacation. I have an aunt who's eager to see her elderly right. dad in Saskatchewan. It's been a long time since she's been able wow. to visit him, and she's vaccinated and wants to go see that he's okay. I know you spoke with a U.S. citizen who owns a home in Canada. I can't imagine he's too happy about this either. Right. I have family as well who's dealing with that same struggle where their parents, they are used to seeing their parents yeah. and they can't uh, make that regular trip. Uh, yeah. If, you know, we spoke to someone yeah. who is an American who owns property and lives in Michigan, but has a house right across the river. And just so you get a sense, Canada is right over there. We're in Detroit right now standing here. So you get a sense of the, pro the proximity there. Listen to what he told us about his frustration and yeah. not being able to go see his friends and neighbors. I don't understand why Canadians and Americans can travel to France or Spain, enjoy a holiday together, but we can't reunite with our families and rejoin our properties and say hello to our neighbors, right, that we've known for multi -gener multiple generations, right? Um, very frustrating. And the other thing that's frustrating about the process is it's impossible to plan. It just is another 30-day extension, another 30-day extension, and you don't know, should I hold out? Should I make other plans for the summer? You know, when am I going to get back? So again, the loosening of this restriction, at least going into effect tonight. And we'll see what happens later. Uh, we know that July 21st is a key deadline that uh, folks will start reassessing things. We'll see what happens later this month, Allison. Well, Shaq, there's no question. The pressure is certainly on. Uh, Shaq Brewster in Detroit, right. almost in Canada, but not quite yet. Thanks so much, my friend. <laughs> Have a good one, Allison. Changing of the guard at Amazon, Jeff Bezos stepping down as CEO today after 27 years. But he's not leaving the company, even though he's going to space. NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez looks at the past, present and future for Bezos and Amazon. If we're not one of those important, lasting companies born of the Internet, we will have nobody to blame but ourselves. Amazon was founded in 1994, leading into the dot-com boom, but it wasn't originally the all-encompassing superstore we know today. The idea that sort of entranced me was this idea of building a bookstore online. Jeff Bezos originally started the online shop as a bookstore, hoping to be the largest bookstore on the planet. His focus, however, was customer service. I believe that if you can focus obsessively enough on customer experience, selection, ease of use, low prices, more information to make uh, purchase decisions with, if you can give customers all that, plus great customer service, then I think you have a good chance. The 
e-tailer grew quickly, with the company going public in 1997. Yeah, we have over 3,000 employees and over 4 million square feet of distribution center space. And those are things I'm very, very proud of. And in 1999, Jeff Bezos was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. The 1990s era highs were short-lived. Amazon's stock plummeted after the dot-com bubble burst. By 2002, it had lost about 90% of its value, and the early 2000s were spent without making much of a profit. But Bezos had a plan to diversify the company's offerings. He launched Amazon Prime in 2005, offering members the once novel free two-day shipping. Web services launched the following year in 2006, and Amazon brought the Kindle to market soon after that in 2007. It sold out in just five and a half hours. Amazon Alexa, Echo, tablets, and video all launched in the years following. But not all of Amazon's product launches were successful. In 2014, the company released the Fire Phone to poor reviews. A year later, it was discontinued. In 2013, Bezos, not Amazon, purchased the Washington Post. Then in 2017, the company acquired Whole Foods for $13.7 billion with the hope of integrating it with Prime, sending rival grocery stocks tumbling. But it was in 2018 that Amazon reached new heights. Amazon making history on Tuesday, crossing that $1 trillion market cap milestone. And with that, Bezos became the richest man on the planet. Amazon dominates much of the online retail market, but critics say it's crushing small businesses. We've heard from third-party sellers again and again during the course of the investigation that Amazon is the only game in town. One small business owner we interviewed described it this way, and, he, and, he, and I quote, we're stuck. We don't have a choice but to sell through Amazon. Amazon is also facing antitrust probes by both the United States and European Union in its treatment of third-party sellers. Today, Amazon is the second largest private employer in the United States, with over 800,000 employees. It raised its minimum wage to $15 an hour for U.S. employees back in 2018, but the company faces high turnover rates, with workers reporting being overworked. Amazon warehouse employees in Alabama attempted to unionize earlier this year to no avail. A national unionization effort is now underway. And now Bezos is stepping down from the company on July 5th, 27 years to the day since the company launched. He will transition to the role of executive chairman of Amazon's board and will focus his high energy on Amazon's charitable initiatives as well as the Washington Post. Of course, that is if he survives his trip to space, set for July 20th. The first launch for Bezos' aerospace company, Blue Origin. I, I, think that, I think this is the next frontier for humanity, and I think Jeff Bezos thinks it's the next frontier for him. As for where Amazon will go next, that's something that only time will tell. Investors don't seem too concerned. Bezos departs with the company valued at a near record high $1.75 trillion. Life expectancy in the U.S. dropping dramatically during the pandemic, nearly two years. But what if aging is a disease and that disease is treatable? Dr. David Sinclair addresses that very question in his New York Times bestseller, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. He is a professor of genetics and co-director of Harvard Medical School Center for Biology of Aging. He's basically dedicated his career to researching how to extend healthy and productive human life. Dr. Sinclair, I love your book, and I'm so thrilled that you are here with us today. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to start with a paper your lab just released on how much money the U.S. would save if metformin, basically a type 2 diabetes drug, was widely prescribed to delay aging and extend healthy life by 2.6 years. Would you tell us a little bit more about this drug and what you found? Yeah, so metformin is a really cheap drug. It's taken by millions of type 2 diabetics with high blood sugar. But what's been found is that people that take it actually are protected not just against high blood sugar, but cancer, diabetes, heart disease, frailty. And we calculate that if this drug was used widely and it actually saved lives um, to the tune of 2.6 years lifespan extension, the US, USA alone would save about $83 trillion. And if we could extend lifespan wow. by 10 years, it would be over $300 trillion. 
So we're not just saving lives. We're saving some serious money here with things like this. I have to ask you about something that happened in our country yesterday. Joey Chestnut set a new record at the 4th of July hot dog eating contest. 76 dogs in just 10 minutes. There is no question this is not the way to live longer. Uh, in fact, you say, Dr. Sinclair, that processed red meats like hot dogs and bacon are especially bad for us. So I don't want to ruin everyone's 4th of July barbecues. But what should we do here? Because meat and protein can often be the most satisfying things we eat, especially for athletes, people who exercise a lot. They need to get protein in their body. So what is your best advice here when it comes to eating meat besides don't eat 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes? Right. It's similar to don't drink 200 glasses of red wine, uh, which we uh, don't recommend. <laughs> but you, you can eat meat. Uh, I, I had some uh, some chicken just before I came on air. I was pretty hungry. But you can actually uh, just try to <laughs> okay. too much red meat. Red meat itself is it's not associated with really long life in places around the world. But you know, my, my attitude is, hey, just live life, enjoy it, but just try to, in moderation, keep it down. And actually, it's not so much what you eat, it's when you eat. So I, I'm now down to one meal a day if I can. And that has very likely some long-term health benefits. I'd love to talk about this a little more because in your book, you lay out several ways the average person can live a longer, healthier life. Besides eating a little bit less meat. And the things that you mentioned are not insane asks. They're things like intermittent fasting, exercise, maybe taking some basic supplements. Could you tell us about some of the things that you do and why research shows that they work? Well, yeah, we're on the cutting edge of, of understanding how the biological clock ticks. And it, it turns out that 80 percent, roughly 80 percent of our lifestyle uh, actually impacts our age and the rest is genetic. And we can measure that just with a, a cheek swab, um, even a blood test. And so what I do, uh, and members of my family who voluntarily choose to read my research, like my father, who's now 81, <laughs> uh, we, we don't eat a lot. Uh, we skip breakfast. We try to skip lunch. We have uh, a healthy dinner. Uh, we work out. Um, for men over 50, I'm now 52. It's very important to maintain muscle mass. That's also true for women. Uh, try to move. Get out of your chair. Don't sit down all day. Walk if you can. Run for 10 minutes every few days at a minimum just to get your breath, uh, get out of breath. Um, and I try to also eat foods that are generally stressed. What I mean is uh, don't choose the, the foods that are pale in color. Try to get those bright colored foods because we have this hypothesis that, that seems to be panning out that these foods that are stressed out, such as Oh, grapes uh, that are that are under the light, or uh, you know, a lettuce that is a little bit uh, darker colored than the white stuff is filled with chemicals that our bodies need to turn on defenses, and that's the key. If we sit around, we gain weight, we don't exercise, um, and we're never cold, our bodies get complacent, and our bodies just don't fight against the aging process. Well, we're listening to a lot of your advice in our house. We're cranking up the AC at night. We're intermittent fasting, trying to eat the colorful foods. Uh, hopefully it will lead to long and healthy lives. Uh, the COVID vaccine has been a really hot topic this year. It's what so many of us have to thank for getting back to some sense of a normal life. But a lot of people don't believe in vaccines and aren't taking them. You say that the more diseases we can vaccinate for, the more our life expectancy will rise. And, and I mean, just look at what happened during the pandemic before we had a COVID vaccine, right? Our life expectancy in the U.S. dropped almost two years how key are vaccines in the fight against aging? And given how quickly the COVID vaccine was developed, do you think we'll really start to see quicker, easier vaccine production against other illnesses and diseases soon? Oh, absolutely. This, this was a trial run for probably the, the big disease that's going to come. This, this uh, COVID-19 was not as bad as it could get. So we, it's great that we figured out how to make rapid vaccines and distribute them. But to survive longer, we need to not just protect our insides and the aging process, but we're under threat from the outside world and infections and vaccines are by far our best and safest and cheapest way to make sure that things don't kill us from the outside as well. And particularly as we saw, the elderly are susceptible. And so hand in hand with vaccines and the kind of lifestyle uh, and medicines that I'm developing, uh, we can fight both aging and infection and live perhaps 10 years longer and save all that money in the economy. 
Uh, I hate to put you on the spot here, but if you could pick one thing that our viewers consider in the next year to help extend their lives, what would it be? What would be your one bit of advice that they should just give this a shot and see how it goes? Yeah, uh, so that's easy. As I, as I wrote in uh, Lifespan, the book, uh, and if you want to read it, it's on page 304, the best bang for the buck is to eat less often. And in animal study after animal studies and humans, we know that that giving your body a rest from food, uh, being a little bit hungry, turns on those defenses against aging. And it can really have a dramatic effect later in life uh, in terms of your health. And, and you actually feel much better. I'm doing it now. And I can think better. I move better. I look better. It's all just great. But you don't have to do it all on day one. I would take at least two weeks with some extra hot water and tea and coffee if you want that. But you'll eventually break the habit of always wanting to eat. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sinclair, I'm a huge fan of the book and fascinated by the work you're doing. Thank you so much for being uh, on with us. It was really a privilege to have you here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. He was a college kid just trying to impress a girl and ended up saving a baby's life in the process. NBC's Natalie Morales has a heartwarming story about kindness and rebirth. In the spring of 2018, Dax Hurst was a freshman at Arkansas State University. I was talking to a girl at the time, and she actually said something about going and signing up at a booth that was on campus, and so I decided to go with her, you know, kind of kind of to impress her. That booth was a registry for DKMS, a stem cell donor center. It was a simple cheek swab meant to impress a girl. Oh, wow. But little did Dax know that cheek swab would change more than just his life. Okay. Just over a year later, July 1st, 2019, Mariano Delgado and Victoria Pacheco were celebrating the birth of their beautiful baby boy, Arian. We were sent home with what seemed to be a perfect baby boy. The euphoria of a healthy baby boy lasted just three days. Then Victoria and Mariano received a phone call no parent wants. I dropped to the floor, right? I was completely devastated. Arian had been diagnosed with a condition called severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, also known as bubble boy disease. Arian had no functional immune system. Without treatment and uh, prompt diagnosis, many of these children do unfortunately succumb to infection at a very early age. A common cold could be lethal to Arian. He would need a bone marrow transplant and quickly. I didn't understand it. I just kept saying in my head, just, you know, why and how. Saving Arian was a race against time and the clock was ticking. I was busy at work when I got a phone call I said that I had matched with somebody to be a bone marrow donor and that the kid was you know just a few days old and would not make it if I didn't go ahead and do it. I mean you can't resist that right? I, I don't know how anybody could no ma'am. Perfect matches are incredibly rare. Dax was a 10 out of 10 match with Arian a one in a million moonshot. I received the phone call and it was kind of just like oh yeah we found a donor. It was for once, we felt hope. DKMS flew Dax from Arkansas to Washington, D.C. for the six-hour procedure where they harvested Dax's precious bone marrow stem cells. Then they flew Dax's stem cells to California to be transplanted into 12-week-old Arian. This bag of little cells came in, and it was exciting. You know, it culminates to this one day of, you know, of, of hope. It's like being born all over again in a way. Yeah, they call it your life date. And so we wow. celebrated his life date. Day on um, September 26, 2019. After nearly three months of anxiety, worry, and quarantine, Victoria and Mariano were finally able to exhale. And then Christmas 2019, the best gift ever. We brought him home on the 23rd of December. Right. Just being together in one room with all with my daughter and you know my wife, all in yeah. one room was just surreal. I think we all slept in one room. They had their family back. But there was still something missing. Because of HIPAA laws, the identities of bone marrow donors and recipients are kept private. It was tough, you know, I, I didn't know if it went well or if it worked at all, you know, for the longest time. Both families wanted to meet each other, and in January of this year, they were finally allowed to exchange numbers. I texted him saying like, oh, you know, thank you. Like, I can't, I don't have words, but I can say thank you. The connection had been made, but they'd only exchanged letters and texts until now. Well, I think we might be able to Zoom with him. Yeah. I'll have to do that. Hi, Dad. Hi. How are you? Oh my but 
our surprise wouldn't end there. We can't just say how much. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> 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 and his family Here he is. uniting with Arian and his. But it was this moment that completed a bond more than three years in the making. They are blood brothers in the truest sense of the word. Identical DNA blood matches. Yeah, his blood changed from our blood type to Dax's blood type, which is the extraordinary part of it. I mean, to know that Dax's little army is there to be able to make sure he's fine um, was amazing. Just an amazing, amazing person. And now, I mean, you went from hopelessness to what now? To just happiness. Happiness, and so happy. I think that, that we, we have hope for anything now. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.